Hi, everyone, again. Um, so we'll continue today, uh, and the plan is uh, to first, starting from Whiteman functions that we discussed last time, we are going to go to the Euclidean and we will define Euclidean correlators carefully, uh, which are called stringer functions. Then I'm going to explain what are the properties of the Schwinger functions that can be rigorously established from Whiteman axioms. And these properties uh, of Schwinger functions are called Sturwalder Schroeder axioms. And then in the last uh, part of the lecture, I'll uh, explain what is known about going in the opposite direction. So how can we start with the Osterwalde Schrader axioms and go back to the Whiteman axioms, something which is known as, as the OAS reconstruction theorem. So uh, just uh, as a reminder, what we did last time, we talked about Whiteman functions, which are functions of n variables, uh, which could be defined as uh, expectation values of field operators at uh, n points. Uh, but once we define them this way, we forgot about this uh, definition and we just deal with these functions as, as, as actual distributions in n variables. And something that I uh, want to emphasize again is that here there is no ordering assumed uh, among these points x1, xn, or rather, uh, all orderings, all possible causal orderings are parts of one and the same Whiteman function W. And what is known about this function, so rather distributions, so they're tempered distributions of X1, Xn. Uh, from translational invariance, we can write these distributions of n variables, X1, Xn, as some distributions of n minus one variables, which are uh, coordinate differences, Xi, K. And in this form, uh, we can express the spectral condition, which is that if you take this uh, distribution of n minus one variables, and if you do the Fourier transform, if you write it as a Fourier transform uh, W hat, then it's known that uh, W hat has a support. So it, this, it vanishes unless every vector Q1 Every momentum q1, qn minus one belongs to the forward, to the closed forward light cone. So that's something that we discussed. And now, uh, what we are going to do now is that we're going to take this uh, Whiteman functions and we are going to continue them analytically. So this is done as follows. So we're going to continue analytically to uh, a set which is called forward two. The terminology. So the forward tube is defined as follows. Uh, so the Whiteman functions are defined for real coordinates, so for size, which are elements of the real Minkowski space. So now the forward tube is going to be parametrized by zetas, which are elements of complexified Minkowski space. So it's C1, comma D minus one. And in terms of the real and imaginary part, uh, it is defined as follows. So, the, so there is a real part Xi for each data and the imaginary part eta. So it's Xi minus I eta, where Xi and eta are real, real vectors. And uh, etas are supposed to belong to the open forward cone V plus. So not V plus bar, but open cone. So if you have n minus one vectors, zeta one, zeta n minus one, which can be represented in this form, then you say this is a point of the, of the forward tube. So forward tube is an open set. And so they, uh, this definition is, uh, is interesting because there's this property that Whiteman functions, they continue analytically to the forward tube. So how do we do this? Well, uh, we had this equation that W is as, as functions of Xi, they are Fourier transforms of W hats. And now we just write W as functions of zeta, where zeta are in, are in the forward tube by the same equation. But now we just stick instead of Xi, we, st we stick zetas. 
So this equation needs a little bit of explanation because, okay, uh, one one reason why this is uh, looks sensible is that if you if you write up uh, the inner product, if you write up the exponential e, e, e cubed zeta, then this is e cubed psi uh, plus q eta. And as we said, eta is supposed to belong to the open forward light cone, and Qs are supposed to belong to the closed forward light cone. At least that's where the distribution W hat is supported. And so the inner products Qk, eta k are all negative by this condition. So we're, we're working on mostly plus signature. And so uh, this distribution is, is meaningful, looks meaningful to a physicist because a physicist would just say, look, we just had some integral here and we, we stuck in some imaginary parts. And so the integral converges better than it, it converged. So clearly this makes sense. So that's, that's what uh, physicists would say. Well, that's, that's not quite a good way to say it because that would be a good, a reasoning if the original integral was a true integral, but you should remember that even though here I, I have an integral sign, this is not actually a true integral because we are dealing with distributions and W hat is a distribution, W is a distribution. So this is just some symbolic integral sign, but in fact, that's not how this is all defined, but uh, this is defined as a pairing between distributions and test functions. So what we are going uh, to make this uh, definition rigorous, what we have to do is that we have to explain why this object with which we uh, pair W hat is a good test function. So if you manage to do this, then indeed this is going to imply that W is analytic. Uh, but so this requires a little bit of uh, a little bit of a simple extra step because this uh, indeed uh, decaying exponential it's a decaying exponential inside uh, the forward light cone it's a decaying exponential but of course outside the light cone it's it's a growing exponential so uh, we have to do something about this part which lives outside of the forward light cone but that's easy to do. So what we need to do is that we just have to pick some other function, chi, which, for example, uh, has a support somewhere in, you know, in the region which is bounded by this dashed line. And so even though if, if you do something like that, then even though e to the i q zeta is not a test function because it grows in the negative uh, q direction, so if you multiply it e to the active zeta by this chi, then we get now a good test function because in the positive cone direction, this function is going to decay because uh, of the forward tube condition on etas, on the imaginary parts of zetas. And in the, in the negative uh, q direction, this is just going to be cut off by this uh, chi. So everything is going to be under control. So we have to introduce this chi, but this chi is, you know, it's, it's needed to be introduced, but actually nothing depends on chi very much as long as, uh, as, long as it, it, it has some compact support in this negative Q direction. Actually, I forgot to say one thing about this chi is that chi should have a property that, uh, let me add it is that chi has to be identically one on the open, on the closed forward light cone, of course, because we, we are introducing this chi to cut off the growing direction, but of course we don't want to change anything on, uh, on the light cone itself. So we have to introduce this condition. Okay, so this was a, a, a little example of a technicality that you sometimes have to go through when you are dealing with these uh, distributions carefully. Uh, but once we've done it, uh, what we have as a result is that we defined a function of uh, 
W, w function W of zetas, zeta one, zeta n minus one, which has two properties. So first of all, it's analytic in the forward tube. And it is analytic in the forward tube because the test function with which W hat is paired is an analytic function of zetas in a, is a test function is an analytic function of zetas in the forward tube. And it also has a second property, which is not hard to show, but I'm, I'm going, I have it, uh, the proof in the notes, but I'm not going to show it here, is that if we take this uh, function of zetas, and if we take a limit as eta's as the imaginary parts of zetas go to zero while remaining inside the forward tube, in fact, inside the forward uh, light cone, then uh, this limit exists in the sense of distributions, and it gives us back the Whiteman function. So you see, it's it's a little bit. You have to be a little bit careful here because it wouldn't be careful to say that the Whiteman function itself has analytic continuation because when we talk about analytic continuation, we usually say, well, you have a function which is already analytic somewhere. And then we analytically continue to a larger set, open set. But for the moment, this W, this Whiteman function that we have at our disposal, the right hand side of this equation, we don't know if it's analytic anywhere. For the moment, it's just some temporal distribution. So when we say that we take this temporal distribution and we analytically continue to the forward tube, what we mean is this equation that we have here. On the light, left hand side, we have some analytic function. And the Whiteman function is a boundary value of this analytic function. So uh, um, maybe now I have some questions, but I'm wondering if maybe other people have questions too. And since I'm a co organizer, let me see if there are other people who have questions. They can just speak up now. Well, there is a question from Arthur, I think. Um, yeah, so I, I'm wondering, um, is this what you are, is this how you are defining what it means that tempered distribution corresponding to the Whiteman function to be analytic? Namely that it takes an arbitrary support function like the one you gave and this specific um, exponential function so that when you combine it, it's in the Schwartz class that this is always analytic in the normal sense of analyticity for all such functions? Mm, well, uh, I'm not sure I understood your question, but let me... Uh, I, I can rephrase it. Um, so, so this function is just an ordinary analytic function in the ordinary sense of the word. You know, it has a power convergent power series expansion and zetas and so on. So it's just an ordinary function which takes a bunch of zetas and gives you a number, and that number depends analytically on zeta. So here there is nothing uh, really fishy going on. The only fishy thing that I might think about is is uh, from what I said uh, is that okay, I said at some point that this function. So this is an element of S. Is a function of q, it's an element of s. And I said that this element of s depends analytically on zeta. So it's kind of an Schwartz space valued function which depends analytically on zeta. So uh, that's uh, so this notion may require a little bit uh, more care to be defined. So we, we are comfortable with vector valued analytic functions. And here I'm talking, you might be more comfortable with Banach space valued analytic functions. And here I'm talking about Schwartz space valued analytic functions, this uh, test function. And so, and then I use the fact that if you take a distribution and if you contract it, if you pair it with a Schwartz space valued analytic function, which is this, uh, which is this uh, thing here. then you get an ordinary analytic function. So that's what I use. But this is for, is there not some implicit dependence on chi, your choice of chi, that you then have to remove and say that 
the analytic function that you get is going to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you define it like this, you, uh, you introduce chi, you define it everything like this. And then you prove a little lemma that if you change chi by another chi, then your analytic function doesn't change. Thanks. But that's really like a one a one line argument. So... I'm just happy to hear you say it. <laughs> yeah. That the argument is there. I think there's another question. Julie? Oh, I, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean. <laughs> sorry. Okay. Since you call on me, uh, if I can, can I understand in the simpler way? Before you get too much into distribution, if you just call W an analytic function in such a way when you approach the real axis, it has real and imaginary part. Uh, you are, if I understand it correctly, this is really the case. You get the imaginary part equal to your W. That's, that's really, so you're continuing the so-called discontinuity itself as analytic function. Is that correct? Mm, not really, not really. I'm first of all, I'm continuing the full W, not just its imaginary part, but the full W. W has real part, imaginary part, and I have to continue. Yeah, well, it. precisely. Let, yeah. Me, let me do it in reverse. You have the right-hand side of the equation. Let's, for the moment, assume it's a real function of your you C. Can, you cannot assume it's a real function. Now, now just take the simpler, you know, not, not the most general case. Simple case where W itself is defined to be a real function and has vanishes below some point. I mean, so, it cannot so, be a real function because if it were a real function, it would not have, it would not satisfy spectral property that okay, the transform okay. vanishes in the forward light cone. Okay. Uh, okay. If you take uh, a real function, you take its Fourier transform, it's just going to be uh, okay. uh, non-zero everywhere. You know, in order to have Fourier transform vanish in the forward light cone, there has to be some big conspiracy between real and imaginary part. Okay. Maybe I can say it differently. Yeah. Let's for the moment assume your right hand side equation W yeah. is defined as a, it's actually analytic. It, it's functional real variable. So, so you can let it continue it. That's, that's, that's right left hand side a little continuation of this W in the region where it's defined to be non-zero. Mm -hmm. So therefore now you want to work backwards. So you, you can do moment, this, but that would be, that, that would be uh, contrary to the logic of, of the theory, because how do you know that W is analytic? For the moment, because, let's say, you, you just you know start, we started from certain axioms, right? From these axioms, from these axioms, as I explained last time, we don't know that W is analytic. Actually, it's a non-trivial problem even to show that W is a, is a function, and I'm going to show it in a second, that it's actually possible to show that W is actually somewhere a function. For the moment, W but, is just some crazy distribution. We know nothing about this. I, I understand. I appreciate and yet, under these very general conditions, you can show that this crazy distribution appears as a boundary value of a certain Nice okay. analytic function. Now, if I were to use a free field as an example, I know how to write down the right hand side. They are ordinary, simple, they are functions, which I know what they are in the case of free field. So, therefore, in that. No, example, even, even in the case of free field, it's a distribution on the light cones and so on. There are singularities. I understand. On the light cone itself, they are functions of those variables. Okay, so what do you suggest? So, we, so, should, so, we should do like free field for the rest of our lives? It's oh, like... no, 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 of course. <laughs> I understand. I, I understand you, 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 you are, think this, of course, you want to generalize. Unperturbatively. I want a general theory. So I, I think okay. at some uh, point- Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, uh, I, I just I, think at some point, you know, we uh -huh. just have to get used to the fact that this W is much more complicated. You know, some people may have uh, hopes that this W is going to be some simple object. And in some regions, it's going to be a simple object, but we just have to 
get used to the fact that there are some points xi there's going to be some crazy configurations of xi for crazy causal orderings uh -huh. where it's very unlikely that you're going to be able to make sense of this w as an ordinary function anytime soon and so uh, and so we have to not to be afraid to use this uh, this general language okay. in the end it's no more general than to say that delta function is a uh -huh. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Th sorry to, to have. Any other question? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I just wanted to maybe make a comment that I think it's interesting that this uh, limit representation uh, gives this uh, interesting property that Python functions cannot vanish in open sets because otherwise they would be identically zero. Python um, distributions, I mean. Yeah. So 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 uh, th this is a as Peter is pointing out this corol this uh, one interesting corollary of this effect that they prove that that Whiteman function is is the boundary limit of analytic functions uh, is that it cannot vanish indeed on a somewhere on an open set. If it were to vanish somewhere on an open set, then it would be identically zero everywhere. So this is a. Uh, it's an interesting uh, property this is an interesting corollary and there are going to be more corollaries of this fact so this kind of fact is very fundamental the synthetic computation to the forward tube it starts a whole series of developments uh, from which many interesting properties of this white and functions will follow kind of for free almost for free so we will see in a second i i think edward was giving a kind of Less rigorous proof of this fact in his lectures than proving a rich ladder theorem. So that's why I'm mentioning. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's, uh, uh, he was uh, indeed proving something uh, that we now can derive as a corollary. Yeah, so we can kind of. Half of first lecture of Edward follows from this as a corollary. Yeah. Thanks, Peter, for pointing this out. Okay, let me continue then. So, uh, so now uh, we we can finally uh, start defining our Euclidean correlation functions, which are Schwinger functions. So, uh, so I don't have to. You, you've seen the weak rotation in uh, in QFT courses. I I just I'm just what I'm trying to show here is that we can do this weak rotation rigorously. So what we are going to do is that uh, we are going to pick a particular value for zetas, which are going to be of this form. So the the time component, the complex time component, is going to be negative. Uh, I epsilon k. So epsilon k is going to be a positive number, real number. So that satisfies the forward tube condition. And uh, the, the spatial component of zeta is just going to be some real, purely real vector psi k. So as you as you see, you know, I've proved that this white noise function is analytic in the forward tube, but now I, I'm not using this big forward tube i'm just using a small section of it where i set special parts pu purely real and temporal parts purely imaginary and with negative uh, imaginary part and so but you know white function analytic in the forward tube in particular it's analytic at these values of zetas so let me take this analytic continuation to this point and let me denote Euclidean points yk equal epsilon k psi k. So I'm I'm writing here explicitly that uh, this is a Euclidean vector yk Euclidean, uh, but I'm not going to always consistently uh, write this Euclidean. So sometimes it's going to be understood. And so this defines uh, Euclidean correlation function, Schwinger function of n minus one coordinates, but these are coordinate differences, right? So what now I have to do is that I have to take 
n Euclidean points, uh, x1 Euclidean, xn Euclidean, which have y case as as uh, as the coordinate differences, like this. And so I am now defining my Schwinger function of n coordinates x1, xn as this small Schwinger function of coordinate differences. So this is just a definition. So this definition, which ensures that the Schwinger function is translation invariant, as it should be. So, so this defines uh, the Schwinger function, but it doesn't yet define the Schwinger function everywhere. It only, so the definition that I gave, it defines the Schwinger function for Euclidean point configurations, which are ordered in Euclidean time. So the way I defined it by analytic attention, I, I, I demanded that this epsilon k are positive because that's uh, the condition for the forward two, which means that I obtained through this procedure that I just described, Schwinger functions provided that tau one, the first Euclidean time is larger than tau two, and so on, larger than tau n. And so that's why I put here this subscript ordered to, to make sure that uh, we, we remember that. So, so this means that I haven't yet finished my definition, but okay, I already obtained something. So any questions about this? So some simple remarks. So what did we do? So what I explained is just the rigorous version of what we all know very well is that to continue from Minkowski to Euclidean time, you have to continue time, Minkowski, Minkowski time to minus I tau. So that if you do this, then the, uh, the usual evolution, Schrodinger evolution operator e to the minus IHT becomes e to the minus H tau. So that's all I did. So another simple comment is that I followed, uh, so the, 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 I followed this continuation path, which brought me from uh, Euclidean to Lorentzian or from Lorentzian to Euclidean. And so I insist that this continuation path, that the way we describe it, it must lie in the forward tube. So that's, uh, that was important so that everything was analytic. And so this uh, Schwinger functions that we define this way, they are uh, real analytic functions of Euclidean coordinates, translation invariant, and uh, locally rotation invariant. Now, what does this mean? So rotation invariance follows, uh, infinitesimal rotation invariance follows because our Whiteman functions were Lorentz invariant. And since everything becomes, uh, in particular, they were infinitesimal Lorentz invariant. And so when you do the analytic continuation, infinitesimal Lorentz invariance becomes infinitesimal rotational invariance of Schwinger functions. So what, the reason why I say locally here is that uh, since we defined so far our Schwinger functions only for time ordered configurations, it means that when you do a finite rotation, you better preserve the ordering that you're imposing. Because if, if, you know, if the ordering is violated, then you have to think how to interpret this. So, so here's uh, the same thing in pictures. So the first thing you do is that you define, uh, here's a Euclidean time ordered configuration of four points, x1, x2, x3, x4. And the first thing I did is that I defined Schwinger function for such configurations. Then I say that if you do a small Euclidean rotation, R, such that, you know, it, it rotates my point configuration, but the ordering is still the same. X1 is still X2, is still in, you know, the, the, the tau variable is still X1, X2, X3, X4, the same ordering. Then uh, under such small rotations, my uh, Schwinger function is invariant by construction. 
But now, if you if you do a big rotation, so that the configuration is not ordered anymore in the tau direction, then you have to think what to do. So, a priori, you don't know what the Schwinger function for this configuration is. But actually, this this is not a bug. This is a feature. So what what we are going to do now is that we are if you have a configuration like this, which can be obtained from an ordered configuration by such a big rotation, then we are just going to define the Schwinger function for such a configuration to be equal uh, to the configuration to the ordered Schwinger function, you know, in the unrotated configuration. This is just let's just accept this as a definition. But, this but, is, yeah. but you could have an independent definition or start from yeah, yeah, yeah. That's something very important that I'm going to discuss in a second. So uh, so this is a good definition. This is a good definition. Uh, but as Joe is pointing out, now I, I you know for some Schwinger functions, I can have several definitions, and all I have to do, I have to think a little bit what's going to happen without this plethora of, of definitions. And so there is this. Uh, Slava, Slava, does yeah. something special happen when uh, the separation in tau is zero? Uh, yeah, you have to show in particular that nothing special happens. So here is okay. the definition. <laughs> Thank you. With this definition, nothing special happens because uh, because uh, R, uh, since when tau, if, if I use this definition that I just gave to define my Schwinger function, right, yeah, then then nothing special happens because uh, my matrix R is just analytic through this configuration, and everything is going to be analytic. Right. So you can re you can approach the the equal time from both directions and get yeah. the same answer. No, I haven't yet proven that you get the same answer. Oh, okay. So so far, I proven that you know for every ordering, yeah, you, you get one ordered Schwinger function, which you can then extend to different configurations to rotation. Yeah. Okay. But now we have this uh, uh, interesting thing to prove is that what happens if you have several different ways to define the same Schwinger function? Okay. And good. so and, and and so this is answered by uh, the following theorem that uh, says that uh, everything is consistent, that all definitions that you can possibly imagine, they're going to give the same Schwinger function. And this Schwinger function is going to be invariant on the permuting points. So that's uh, a theorem which really needs to be proven. It's not obvious at all at this stage. And so let me just give you an example of how this theorem is applied for, for the three point function case. So here I'm, I'm taking three points, x1, x2, x3. And I can, uh, I can consider two different uh, tau axes. So I can either take a tau axis like this, or I can take a tau axis like that. So if I use the tau axis like this, then x1 is the ordering is x1, x2, x3. So this configuration, this axis, defines for me the Schwinger function s of x1, x2, x3 for this Euclidean time ordering. If I use the other axis tau prime, then the ordering is different, x2, x1, x3. So I define another Schwinger function s, x2, x1, x3. These two Schwinger functions are defined by two different analytic continuation paths uh, from the same, you know, you start from the same Whiteman function on the boundary, you take two different analytic continuation paths, and you get two different Schwinger functions. And then the theorem says that, in fact, these two numbers are the same, identical. So actually, this theorem doesn't really have a very simple proof, to my knowledge. So e even though it's something that we, uh, we usually take for granted, but it's uh, it's not um, 
it's not a totally obvious theorem and uh, in spite of that i think the proof is very instructive so i'm going to say a few words about it because it's really uh, yeah can i go just ask one quick question from yeah. the naive point of view which i realize is not sufficient but if you think of it as taking t to it then it means these two different paths represent two different hamiltonian definitions from the whiteman function point of view uh yeah well it's not just yeah it's not just t to it because you see you do t to it but in addition you you do this rotation on top you know, first analytically continue and then you do the rotation so in fact as I'm going to show in a second, this rotation, one way to think about this rotation is some sort of complex Lorentz transformation, which, uh, which is the key to the proof of this theorem. So okay. I'll, I'll wait till the further yeah. explanation. Great, thanks. Yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm going to give you an idea of the proof of this theorem and uh, the, the key. So if you think about this, the key to the proof is that uh, we want to show that two functions are the same. So how do you show that two analytic functions are the same? Well, the idea is that you have to show that they kind of they are the same part of one big analytic function. So you have to define some really big analytic function defined on a big on a much bigger space. And these two different orderings of Schwinger function, they are a part of this big analytic function. And so and then they're going to be the same. So this is the idea. So what is this big analytic function that uh, we want to define? So uh, there is this, the key word here is something which is called extended to. So there's a little bit of terminology here. So we, we defined analytic continuation of widening function to the forward tube. Now we are going to analytically extend it even further from the forward tube to a, to a bigger set, which is called extended tube. So extended tube is uh, again parameterized by complex zetas, zeta one prime, zeta n minus one prime. And uh, these complex zetas, they obtained from zetas in the forward tube. So forward tube is a Lorentz invariant, of course, uh, subset of of the complex um, of, of the uh, of the complex Minkowski space, but in addition to the real Lorentz transformations, it's natural to consider complex Lorentz transformations. Now you, you have to think a little bit how to to define complex Lorentz transformations, but the, the good way to define them is a set of complex matrices, which satisfy the same equation as. Uh, real Lorentz transformation, so lambda t eta lambda equals eta with the same eta. So you don't include any complex conjugations here, it's just uh, transpose and uh, just transposition. So this is a set of Lor complex Lorentz transformations. And then you, uh, by the same trick, so in fact, this idea of extending uh, Weidman functions from forward tube to the extended tube, it's the same idea that you already used when we extended Schwinger functions by adding the rotation, an extra rotation from some set. So first to define Schwinger functions for order Schwinger functions. And we said, oh, but actually Schwinger functions can be extended even more by these rotations. So this complex Lorentz transformation is the same idea, but in the, in the complex space. So, so basically, you know, given that uh, Weidman functions in the forward tube are Lorentz invariant, you can for free or almost for free define them, uh, extend them to this extended tube, which is which is a larger set, which is a larger set of of points. And and the equation that you use to extend it is is basically the equation that f that uh, w uh, w of lambda zeta is equal to w so small small w 
of lambda zeta is equal to W of zeta. So that's the equation that you consider. So this equation for real lambdas is just expresses, uh, this, is, uh, this is the definition. It expresses just Lorentz invariance for real lambda. And for complex lambda, it, it becomes an equation which extends W to a larger set. No, you have to think a little bit if it's really a larger set, but it is a larger set. And so uh, you have to you have uh, to prove since it's a larger set, uh, various points of this set can be obtained from various points of the extended tube by different lambdas. So you have to prove that this extension that you're defining is single valued. And so there is a theorem which says that in fact, no ambiguities have uh, appears. So everything is uh, so the geometry of of Lorentz transformations is sufficiently simple, so that uh, the extension you obtain is single valued. It's called Bargman Hole Wycombe theorem. And so, why is this an interesting uh, thing? Well, here is some schematic. Uh, picture which shows why it's an interesting thing. So what do I show here? I show here, so the, here I have a Minkowski space schematically. So on above every point of Minkowski space, of real Minkowski space, I added some imaginary part. So this gives me my forward tube. But the forward tube has an obvious uh, property is that the forward tube is, is an open set, and every point in the forward tube has some imaginary parts in it. And so it means, in particular, obviously, that the forward tube has zero intersection with the, with the original Minkowski space with which you started. It's just some, something which lies outside of the Minkowski space. So now you start with this forward tube, and you start acting on the forward tube by this complex Lorentz transformations. If you were just to act with real Lorentz transformations, nothing would change because they, of course, preserve the forward tube. But the complex Lorentz transformations, they don't actually preserve the forward tube. So they uh, have an effect of tilting, you know, each complex Lorentz transformation, it has an effect of tilting this cone a little bit left or right. And actually, this has a very interesting consequence, is that once you tilt this cone, it might actually turn out, and it does turn out, that some points of the extended tube, they have a non-trivial intersection with the Minkowski space with which you started. So what I want to say is that uh, extended tube uh, has a non-trivial intersection uh, with Minkowski space itself. While the forward tube, of course, uh, has trivial intersection. Well, I mean, strictly speaking, I have to write here not just Minkowski space, but the space of endpoint configurations and so on. Um, and and okay, but, but this has an amazing consequence is that you know every point which lies both in the extended tube and in the Minkowski space, if you, if you manage to find such a point, it means that the Whiteland function is going to be analytic there. So if we started with Whiteland functions which were just distributions. Then we analytically continued them somewhere for a tube, which was, it looked like it had no relation to Minkowski physics. It, perhaps it had some relation to Euclidean physics, but not to Minkowski physics. But now we start acting on this forward tube, get extended tube, and we can get back to the Minkowski physics. And whenever we can do this, the Whiteman function is guaranteed to be analytic there because the Whiteman function is analytic everywhere in the extended tube. 
So that's that's quite amazing. And this uh, such real points in, in the extended tube, they are called Yost points. They're they're classified. There's some simple classification which we don't need. And the important point is that they are all space-like. So all these points that uh, have this property, they all are space-like to each other. Configurations are fully space-like. And so using this, uh, using this uh, fact, we prove that the Whiteman function is actually analytic, has to be analytic whenever points are space-like separated. So I spoke for a long time without interruption. So maybe some questions. Well, I guess this may be it's obvious, but uh, so, I mean, this is of course what we expect because if we go to Schwinger functions in Euclidean and then it's analytic there, and now to consider space-like is the same as Euclidean, right? So, but, uh, but it's a maybe maybe the logic is the is the problem here. What what do you know first? Yeah, what do we know first? Yeah, we don't. Uh, we, 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 I mean, we haven't even. You know, what I'm doing now is kind of an intermediate result towards showing that Schwinger functions are even meaningful because I haven't even showed that they are permutation invariant and so on. So it's kind of. Uh, but also, space like doesn't mean that. They are all at t equals zero, right? They could also be, be at different times, so it might not be might not be able to interpret this as Euclidean configuration. Yes, yes, yeah. I see. Yes, that's true. Mm -hmm. yeah, thanks, Peter. Uh, can I can I just ask about something else? You went very fast. Maybe it's trivial. You said the the Schwinger functions are real analytic. Is it uh, obvious immediate this reality condition? I I didn't get so. Ah, well, this allows me to, to say something uh, forcefully, something very important is uh, um, what it means for a function to be real analytic. So in mathematics, uh, real analytic, uh, real in real analyticity refers not to the function, but to the space on which it is defined. If you have a function which is uh, defined in Euclidean space for Euclidean coordinates, it's a, it's not an open subset of of uh, CD. So such a function, it doesn't make sense to to say that it's analytic because analyticity means that there is some open set where the function can be represented by convergent parentheses and so on. So if function is defined just on a Euclidean space, uh, and if this function is analytic in some small neighborhood of every point, but that neighborhood can be arbitrarily small, you don't, you, and you don't care how small this neighborhood is, such a function is called real analytic. So th this uh, real uh, analyticity, it, uh, it does not say anything. So the function itself can take complex values or real values or, or Banach space values doesn't really matter. So real here refers to, to the space, not the function. I see, thank, thank Now you. in some uh, areas of theoretical physics, uh, particularly in the s matrix bootstrap, this, uh, Terminology of real analyticity has lately been used with real referring to the function, not the space. And I think uh, it created some confusion. So it would be better to come up with some different terminology consistent with mathematics. I'm confused by the variables. The Schwinger function starts off as being n points in d dimensions. So it has d times n uh, variables, right? Yeah. But we know, of course, the symmetries mean that it depends only on the uh, uh, Lorentz invariant, uh, well, <laughs> Euclidean Lorentz invariant differences. What are you continuing in? All, all, all ND points? Uh, well, here I did not, uh, here I only used translation invariance, so I did not uh, really 
Uh, but when you're talking about real elasticity, uh, how many variables are you using for the uh, weight, the uh, Stringer function? I, I used uh, n times d variables. OK. Yeah. So you can take each one independently yeah, yeah, and yeah. define it as a, an, a real analytic function in each one independently. Yeah, yeah. OK. So maybe so, one more question, Slava. So this, this theorem that the function it was single valued in the extended tube, this, uh, what is the idea? Is it like the, because Lorentz Lorentz transformations are like simply connected or? Yeah, that... so the idea is that uh, uh, that Lorentz transformation, you have to study the group of Lorentz group. Uh, and you have to show that there are no, the topology is sufficiently simple. Okay, thanks. So, um, Okay, but now we can uh, we can finish the the proof of this theorem. So because uh, so we, we now have shown that Whiteman function somewhere is analytic. So before it was just a distribution. Now we show that it's analytic. Moreover, it's analytic where it's space-like. But at the same time, where it's space-like, we know that the Whiteman function as a distribution. Satisfy this macro causality constraint that the operators could commute. Before we only said that it was true in the sense of distributions, but now, if all n points are uh, space-like separated to each other, we know that the function is analytic. So the same property must be true already in the sense of analytic functions, so the permutation invariance. So. Uh, so now uh, we, we take this property and we extend analytically the Whiteman function to an even bigger set, which is called permuted extended tube, which is the union of all permutations of points in the extended tube. So we have, we have a function, you know, which is permutation invariant somewhere. Now let's extend it to this permuted extended tube. So you have to show again, there is a little bit of, uh, of technicality. You have to show that uh, this extension, it does not create again any ambiguity, but that's uh, you know, relatively easy to show. So now you have an analytic function in the permuted extended tube, which is a big set, very, very big set. And everywhere in this permuted extended tube where the function is defined, it has to satisfy this uh, permutation invariance because it's an analytic function and it's somewhere it satisfies this permutation invariance, so it must satisfy it everywhere. So uh, now uh, this was a very roundabout way, but the only actually known to me way towards showing that the Schwinger functions are permutation invariant because so you have shown this that there is this big analytic function which is permutation invariant. Now you restrict again to some subset which corresponds to the Schwinger functions, and you show that the Schwinger functions are permutation invariant. So uh, it's uh, it's kind of a convoluted theorem, but I wanted to give this argument. I think it gives the spirit of the kind of arguments that people are going through in this uh, axiomatic field. So there is a, there's a lot of use, uh, smart use of uh, analyticity in several complex variables. Uh, and combination of this with properties of distribution. So I wanted to give you the spirit. So any questions? Is, is this permuted extended to what they call a uh... Is it a natural domain of analyticity or something when, when you? It, no, it, it's not. Hmm. And actually this opens a whole new field of research about to understand whether, you know, how can it be extended even further? And it's not, it has not been fully understood except in some cases, maybe for three point functions. Hmm. May, may I ask a question? Sure. If you forget about this going to the Lorentzian limit, 
if you start out just doing Euclidean field theory, then Schwimmer function for a single scalar field, this property is just true, isn't it? So, uh, uh, this well, permutation we were in the case of. Well, well it's, it, it is, of course, true. And so, once, so what the way the logic of the story goes is that now we are going to formulate all properties of the Schwinger functions. And then I'm going to say uh, some words about what happens if you want to go in the opposite direction. If you want to. I, start I understand. I, but, I understand. But, you, know, you have to start even with one or the other. Uh, otherwise, yes. it's kind of uh, yours. For, for those who are used to doing Euclidean field theory, you're starting out, it's really true. You'll check how you're used in a few seconds because there, okay. might, be, there might be some properties of Euclidean field theory that uh, even you are not familiar with. <laughs> well, well, yes, I, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> <We'll see. laughs> okay. okay, but I'm, I'm doing really, uh, yeah, I'm not doing very well all the time, but okay. Um, how many questions? I, I might have to go like 15 minutes over time if it's uh, okay. So, uh, so let me uh, state some further properties of Schwinger functions. And here, you know, I, I treated one theorem in detail. So let me treat other theorems without so much detail. So one interesting property is that the Schwinger function, and here I'm starting really to formulate them as axioms is that the Schwinger function is parallel bounded. So what does this mean? It means that if you take n points and let me define the smallest par, uh, pairwise distance small r and the biggest uh, pairwise distance big R, then actually for uh, any n point Schwinger function that we defined, uh, there is a bound. So it, it's bounded by some constant which depends on n and then this number big R plus one over small r, which characterizes the roughly the geometry of the configuration to some power a n. So which this number C n and a n, they don't depend on axis, they only depend on, on the Schwinger function of the consideration. So that's a, a parallel bound in Euclidean space. And uh, okay, uh, the proof of this bound I'm only going to prove this bound for time ordered configurations. Uh, there is a little step in the argument which tells you how to go from any configuration, how to pick an appropriate time ordering, but that's, uh, you can think about this in the notes. And here you see the main idea is this I define my Schwinger function for time ordered configurations as a pairing of W hat with some test function f, which was of this form. It was some exponential, uh, real exponential, decaying exponential, and there was some chi on which nothing depended. And this was a Schwartz test function. So now we know that for every distribution, in particular for w hat, there exists a constant c and some Schwartz space norm n. This was a definition of continuity of distribution such that the uh, the pairing is smaller than a constant time times the norm of f. And so now what you have to do is that you just have to see how the norm of this test function f depends on various variables at your uh, disposal, which are epsilons and xis. So if epsilon becomes very, very small, this function f becomes very, very flat. And so the norm grows, but it grows no faster than a, a power law. Then if xis become very large, then this function f starts varying very fast in the q direction. And since in the norm there are uh, derivatives, it means that the derivatives are going to grow, but again, not faster than the power law. And so this gives you basically a parallel bound for the Schwinger function, very robust. And what controls the power, this A, this capital A? The power is controlled by this N. 
So this A is going to become uh, some simple multiple of N, I think. So at this point, we don't know the physical meaning. At, at this point, we don't know the physical meaning, but um, but uh, for example, uh, well, you, you don't know the physical meaning, but you can also um, with a little bit of uh, extra work, you can elucidate the physical meaning. For example, this W hat, this W hat is a is a Fourier transform of your Whiteman function. So this Fourier transform, for example, might have some singularities on the light cone, and the strength of the singularities is going to control this n. So if uh, if your Whiteman function is very singular, uh, is if W hat is very single in the light cone, then you know, this n could, uh, or if W hat grows very fast at infinity for large Q, then this could, this could control this this n. Uh, but in this general framework, hard to say uh, more. But for example, uh, when in the next lecture we do the CFT case. We will be recovering this uh, power loss from the CFT expansion, and there it would be just related to, in the usual way, to, to the scaling dimensions of CFT operators and such. Thanks, Alan. Okay, then, uh, then uh, there are. Uh, three more of the right shredder axioms and they all involve this very important uh, operation of Euclidean time reflection operation which I think everyone is familiar with so I'm going to uh, very rapidly so there is this uh, operation which flips the sign of Euclidean time x0 to minus x0 and this operation theta it it is uh, it enters uh, the hermeticity property of Schlinger functions. So the Schlinger function at, at the reflected axis is the complex conjugate of the Schlinger function at the original axis. And this follows just from Whiteman uh, hermeticity. And it also enters this very important property of uh, reflection positivity. Now, again, you know, in our field, most people are uh, familiar with reflection positivity. So I just want to emphasize here one thing is that usually uh, reflection positivity is stated in our field as a condition of this form where you take two endpoint function and you insert two n operators, you insert n operators at points x1, xn and you insert n other operators at the reflected points. And you say that such a two endpoint function has to be non negative. So that's kind of a reflection positivity, the way we usually state it. But in fact, uh, much more is true. So, just like in um, Whiteman positivity, when we considered positive uh, definiteness condition, we could consider more complicated states involving not just. Um, endpoints but various linear combinations of uh, n operator insertions with different n the same thing here so what you are supposed to do more carefully is that you again uh, consider uh, a sum over different m and n's uh, linear combinations of schlinger functions of order n plus m against some test functions and there are going to be some test functions supported in the uh, in the lower half plane and their reflections supported in the upper half plane and so such an inner product has to be uh, positive semi definite that's uh, kind of more general the most general reflection positivity condition that you're supposed to consider and okay uh, this follows from white positivity this condition can be derived from Whiteman positivity. In fact, so if you just take this, uh, if you take this uh, reflection positivity condition, you express it in Fourier transform on the Fourier transform side, and you see what it means. 
you will see that it basically means uh, Weitman positivity for a particular choice of test functions in um, in the Weitman positivity, which are going to be expressible in terms of these f's and g's in terms of some Laplace transform, like in the time variable. So even though this is a it's a consequence of Weitman positivity, it has one very important difference from Weitman positivity is that in in the Weitman positivity, because the Weitman positivity did not involve this uh, reflections, in the Weitman positivity, you had an integral which was going through the coincident points. So necessarily, the Weitman positivity condition involves an integral of Weitman functions across coincident points. And so those integrals, they could only be defined in the sense of tempered distributions. So that's why we insisted all along that Weitman functions have to be tempered distributions, blah, blah. Otherwise, you can't even make sense of this positivity condition properly. Here, we are on a much more familiar ground. There are no, there is no more any need to talk about distributions. So the Schwinger functions are ordinary analytic functions. The, you never have to worry about what happens at coincident points. You're not forced to define them as distributions at coincident points. The integral here is safely away from all coincident points. It's just an integral because all our test functions, they are supported away from coincident points. And so this condition looks, yeah, kind of much more down to earth in a sense. That's why we like it, of course. So there's also a clustering condition that I'm not going to uh, talk about, but perhaps if there are any questions about reflection positivity, it makes sense to pause for a minute. No questions. And so let's then go to the last uh, page, a couple of pages of this lecture and discuss the Osterwalder Schrader reconstruction theorem. So this is a theorem from 1975. Uh, and it says that if you take a set of Schwinger functions for every n, so for n equals one, two, three, and up to infinity, you impose on the Schwinger functions these uh, axioms OS1, OS4 that we discussed. And you impose an extra condition, which is called the linear growth condition. Then you can go all the way back from where we came. Namely, you can show that you can perform the analytic continuation all the way back to the Lorentzian space. You can take the limit. You can show that this limit satisfies Weitman axioms. From Weitman axioms, you can apply the Weitman reconstruction theorem, which gives you the Hilbert space, the field operators, and that's it. So you're basically, you recovered everything you might possibly want to know about uh, your quantum field theory. So it's a powerful theorem, uh, but it's a, it's a tricky theorem. And in fact, uh, the first proof of this theorem, which was given in 1973 and published in Communications in Mathematical Physics, so even though it's kind of an ostensibly rigorous journal, even in that journal, some papers have mistakes. Uh, it did not, it claimed that the same theorem is true without this linear growth condition. But, you know, the first proof of, uh, was found to contain a mistake, which could not be fixed. Apparently, this mistake is, a, is, a, is an important mistake. And so, you know, to save the theorem, two years later, they came up with this linear growth condition, which at the time was thought as a sort of fix, you know, let's just 
fix the theorem quickly and so that we have a theorem. But you know, 45 years down the road, this is still with us. We cannot do any better than this. And so what is this linear growth condition? It says that uh, in this inequality that I said the Schwinger function has to be parallel bounded, and there are these two constants, Cn and Dn, which depend on n. So it says that these constants, they could not grow with n too fast. So in particular, this constant a n should not grow faster than linearly in n. And the constant c n should not grow faster than some power of factor. So, well, take it or leave it. You know, there's not much intuition about this. Why this power of factorial? Why linear? But you can try to check if some theories that you know satisfy this linear growth condition. And you will find that, for example, free theories and GFFs, they satisfy this condition. And factorial is natural because the number of weak contractions grows as a factorial. And so it's important to have factorial. Uh, you can show that, for example, in the two dimensional easing model where correlators are explicitly known, you can also check that this satisfied but in a general cft it's a novel problem you don't know if in the general cft in two dimensions or in d dimensions this is satisfied there's no uh, argument that i know of and so maybe somebody will be interested to look at this and i lava yeah uh... What was this capital R and little r in your inequality? I missed that part. It's the, it's the big R is the radius, is the diameter of the configuration, and the, the small r is uh, the this, this smallest distance. OK, I see. Thanks. So, so there's no dimension dependence on this thing. That's what you're, which is surprising. There's no dimension dependence. You mean which space dimension or which dimension? Yeah, yeah, the space time dimension. Uh, no, not really. Actually, this theorem is uh, almost uh, as hard to prove in 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 one D, in two D, as in as in any D. It's really. I mean, I, I mean, I'm obviously sort of thinking of it quite slightly wrong. But R goes to infinity is the um, sort of infinite volume limit, and I'm surprised that there's not a dependence on dimension. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, you would expect that in higher dimensions, this condition would have to be strengthened or relaxed. I, I mean, I, I'm obviously somewhat wrong, but I, I would expect it to be dependent on the volume and not just the linear uh, separation R. About well, volume, we are working in infinite volume. Which volume? No, I meant the volume that has to be put forward to control to, to contain all the excess. Okay. Well, maybe maybe I'll uh, may, maybe I'll tell you uh, the details of I, I'll I'll just have like one page about some very okay, okay. Anyway, go about, ahead. This proof, about how this proof, and then we can come back to this question. Okay, good. So uh, Ragu is also saying that whether C depends on the space and dimension. So, I mean, the, the theory, we are only working in, we are not working with the family of theories living in different dimensions. We just, you know, C can depend on everything, on the theory in question, uh, on D, but we just give one theory. I think in free theory, probably this capital C that controls AN will be proportional to the dimension, right? Because it's measuring the dimension of the free field. Yes, 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 yes. yes. On, the, on, the, on, the, on the dimension of the field, but not on the space. Not yeah, on but the then field. it's related by unitarity. So. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, let's let's continue. Yeah, I, I have to finish. So let me uh, let me give you just some very basic ideas about the proof. So as I say, uh, the idea is 
the strategy is um, is very simple. So we have to construct this. So we are given these stringer functions. We want to go back to the Minkowski. So we have to somehow analytically continue our stringer functions to the forward tube. So initially, they are just some real analytic functions. As I said, real analytic functions that are analytic in an arbitrary small neighborhood, but we have to show that actually they can be analytically continued to the whole forward tube. And we have to show that this analytic continuation that we should somehow construct that it's it doesn't grow too fast when we approach the Minkowski space because then we can apply Vladimirov's theorem, which I explained last time, to show that the limit exists, and then you can show that all Whiteman function Whiteman axioms are satisfied. So that's the that's what you need to show. Just you know construct this analytic continuation. And what are the tricks that you have at your disposal? I mean, initially it looks like I mean you all you have almost nothing because what do you know about this functions? You just have this reflection positivity, but actually reflection positivity is powerful because it it gives you some Hilbert space structure because then you have some inner product that means that you have a Hilbert space, and actually it allows you relatively easily. Uh, to rigorously implement at least one thing which physically is reasonable. Namely, what you can do very easily, rigorously, is you can analytically continue in one time. So we have to analytically continue in all times. We have n points, n times. But in one time at a time, you can analytically continue. So if we just have like, uh, let me now switch to intuitive notation for this discussion is that we have a field we have a state of which is produced by n operators in the lower half plane and by acting with the translation uh, generator we shift the times all all n times by the same tau and so the one thing that you can do relatively easily is to analytically continue this tau to tau plus it, but this is going to move all times by the same complex time. So that's much smaller, that's much, much less than what we need to do, but that's something. And to analytically continue in several times, you use uh, uh, tricks from several complex variables. Uh, very um, non-trivial tricks which involve this notion of envelope of holomorphicity that uh, was already mentioned by Joao is that in, in several complex variables there is this generic phenomenon that you often have a function which is analytic in some domain uh, which is maybe this gray, gray domain and then somehow magically you can uh, there is a larger domain d prime such that any function holomorphic in D can, can be extended holomorphically to D prime. So this is a generic phenomenon in several complex variables. There are many, many examples of this phenomenon, and uh, there are books full of theorems of this kind. And so there are some theorems which you know, can be used to do what you want to do. So you start with a function which is just analytic in several times in, individually, and somehow magically you continue it in all times. But that's not all that you want to do because you also want to control the growth of the analytic continuation, as I said. And this you do through this Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. So you, to show that analytically continued say n plus m point function is not too large, then you can bound it by to n point function times to m point function. And at this point, you have to invoke this linear growth condition, which is, so you see, uh, once you use this Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, for example, you want to bound three point functions. So n is one and m is two. But on the right hand side, you have two n is two and two m is four. So you see, you started with a three-point function in the right-hand side, but in the left-hand side, but in the right-hand side, you already have four-point function. And so you have like a whole um, inductive argument and 
higher and higher endpoint functions are going to be drawn into this discussion. And so you cannot say anything about just one endpoint function at a time. You have to work with all of these functions at the same time. So it's really a tough theorem to prove. It's like no real simple proof. Simple proof. Just you have to work really, really hard. And so it, I, I'm not going to say any more about this, but in, um, in our uh, paper, in our second paper, there is a relatively, I would say, I mean, as good as it takes review. Actually, the first, I think, review which in the literature, the, it, this theorem has never been reviewed from its original uh, publication. So you can take a look at it. We did the work. Um, so, yeah, so what do you do in this, uh, in this situation? Well, you do two things. First of all, you, we cannot, in CFTs, we cannot appeal to this theorem because we do not know the linear growth condition. So that's bad. On the other hand, in CFTs, we have conformal invariance, which is not at all used in this proof. So conformal variance is immensely powerful. And so in the next lecture, in the last lecture, we will see how using conformal variance, we can completely, you know, find a completely different strategy for performing this analytic continuation, which is like really like much, much easier. I'm sure that uh, all of us uh, are able, are going to be able to use this. And uh, well, we will see what we can do with this. But for today, I'm sorry for going over time. That's the end of my lecture. Thank you. Let's thank Slava. Are there more questions? I, I, I wanted to ask about uh, Peter's comment about proving the Riesz leader theorem from this. So if I Understood right, the Riesz leader's theorem assumed that some function was zero in real Minkowski space, in some open set in real Minkowski space. But that appears as the boundary in CD. So it's not an open set in CD. And that was also where it was distributional, the Weitman function. So how do we use a power series expansion to control it? So, so what you what you need to show you need to show that if you have uh, if you have um, a function mm -hmm. analytic function in the forward tube which has uh, a zero limit on an open set in the sense of distributions mm -hmm. Then, in fact, this uh, function is forced to be zero everywhere. The distribution is forced to be zero, yeah. No, I mean, so we have a function, we have a function in the forward tube, uh, you know, let, let me call this f, and then the boundary value, so f boundary, so f goes to f boundary, in the sense of distributions, and f boundary is uh, zero somewhere in some open set U. Mm -hmm. So from here, it follows that f is identically zero. And if f is identically zero, of course, f boundary is also identically zero. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is proven uh, through uh, a version of Schwartz reflection principle. Because uh, we, what you do is that you, you, you can, um, so this, this is kind of an open set U. And so let me now take uh, the reflected forward tube. So I can approach my function, I can, I can try to glue what is above the for what I can try to glue the forward tube and the reflected forward tube across the set U. So mm -hmm. there's a Schwartz reflection principle which says that if you have a function uh, which is 
analytic in the upper half plane and it's continuous on, on some section of the boundary, then you can glue what, what happens above with what happens below. And yeah. You can actually obtain a function which is analytic on the boundary. Mm -hmm. So uh, here, provided that this uh, restriction is real, here we have a, a zero restriction. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's zero only in the sense of distribution. So it's not... Yeah. It's not obvious to say that such a such a gluing is possible, so you have to work a little bit. But mm -hmm. but there is a theorem which is called edge of the wedge theorem. Mm -hmm. uh, which tells you that this gluing is possible even for these distributional limits. Okay. And so you prove so what you what you have shown then is that even though initially you only knew that this limit exists in the sense of distributions, you actually have shown that this limit exists in the sense of analytic functions and the boundary is analytic and zero on the sense on the set U. Right. And so Edward basically proved this, but he was assuming that F is a function, right? Like his proof was sort of the Schwartz re reflection principle. Yeah, okay, proof. yeah, he was. Okay. He, he was not um, being uh, super rigorous, but I think, yeah, we can we can try to do it a bit more rigorously using these techniques. What, what I see, but uh, the edge of the wedge theorem, I'm presuming, is then some something more non-trivial. It is. Uh, it is a little bit more non-trivial. Yeah. I agree. Okay. Thanks. I think there was another question from Timothy, but then he lowered the. Oh, I was just curious if the um, the envelope approach you mentioned above, it looked like it was only for space-time dimension greater than or equal to two. Is it just trivial in one dimension or is it? Uh, so, so, the, so in any D, uh, there is kind of a maximal sp open space to which you can analytically continue any function. It's called the domain of holomorphy. So there, there are some open spaces which have the property of the domains of holomorphy, and then from them you cannot continue. There is some function from which you cannot continue. And then, uh, so in any D, there is a property that a convex set, if you're given a convex open set, then it's domain of holomorphy. And in D equal one, um, this, uh, uh, any open set is basically domain of holomorphy. So, uh, so in in D equal one, uh, yeah, it is uh, uh, for any you just have more analytic functions somehow, and then you cannot uh, this uh, non-trivial. You, you never get a, an analytic extension for free. So for any open set, there is some function that you cannot extend. And so it's, there's no magic somehow in D equal one. Um, yeah, just a comment on that. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think if in, in multivariable complex, in complex multivariables, you can't hide poles in compact regions, essentially. So like that picture you had, like in, in a single variable, if you had a compact region, um, you can hide poles of your function there. But in higher, in higher dimensions, you can't. They're always like extend out to infinity. I don't know if that's related, but it's that's one, that's one example of, uh, of of this domain of holomorphy thing. Indeed, the, maybe the most dramatic example is if you take so indeed in uh, as as Arthur says, in D equal one, we can have a function which is uh, which is analytic in uh, in an annulus, but in uh, in the center of the annulus it has a pole, so it cannot clearly be extended to the disk. So that's in C, but in, in C2, if you take in C2, then uh, we can have a situation, uh, we can consider a similar, seemingly analogous situation where you take a function, which is analytic on, on the set absolute value of uh, Z1 uh, squared plus absolute value of Z2 squared is uh, say between two, between two um, numbers, R and R. So you could say that this is kind of the analog of annulus in C2. 
And you can say, well, can, can it be that any, so there is some function which is extended, which is analytic in this annulus, but it cannot be extended to the full disk. But it turns out it's impossible. So any function analytic in this annulus can be extended to Z1 squared plus Z2 squared larger than R, smaller than R for free. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. Uh, Slava? Yeah. Uh, can I go back to your uh, reconstruction uh, page for a second and ask a question? Sure. Um, so, yeah, right here. What, 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 when you had the, uh, the help, yeah, okay. So I, I'm just trying to figure out to what extent I can uh, use the concept of a Hilbert space here. If I were to, um, if I were to pull all of these uh, fields out and have them operate on a vacuum and then let um, the Hamiltonian give you the difference between T1 and T2, right? So in other words, I set all the field uh, arguments to zero, but I, I distribute the Hamiltonian within all of the fields. Yeah. And then define a vacuum. I, I'm allowed to do this at this point. I have a Hilbert space. I have an Hamiltonian operator. I can do that. Are you are you uh, thinking of, of the Hamiltonian operator with Euclidean time? No, I'm in Euclidean space. Yeah, I, I want I want to be in Euclidean space, but I wanted to I want to rewrite your thing as starting with a vacuum and then uh, inserting a Hamiltonian. Well, the vacuum would be defined as the limit the t goes to infinity, tau goes to infinity, and then uh, I will have an operator, an operator, an operator. So I want to write this as an operator expression, but I want to have um, you, you can do the it fields. to some extent, but I can tell you what the, the main difficulty is. is okay, that good. That's what I'm interested initially, in. Initially, you are given the, this sort of states, or you can rewrite in terms of Hamiltonian, as you said. But yeah. Initially, we only know that these states are normalizable only for Euclidean times, because that's what um, Euclidean theory is telling us. So in a, from one point of view, what you need to show is that we can analytically continue these states. So we, we talk, we, you can talk about analytic continuation of Schwinger see, functions, what, what but I'm, you can also analytically, try to analytically continue the whole state as, a, as an element. Right, but see, I mean, I, I, I'm asking where I'm cheating. I wanna, I wanna now have all the fields evaluated at tau equal to zero. And I wanna distribute the- Tau equal to call. zero. Uh, and then I have a transfer matrix, if you like an Euclidean time, uh, we don't Hamiltonian. have field operators. We don't have field yeah. operators. I want to have That's them. I write, write them as field yeah, operators. But we don't have field operators. That's very cheating. But, but it's, not, it's we... not known that they exist as operators in Hilbert space. But that's my question. I mean, we have a Hilbert space. I can't define operators to generate this space. No, Peter, let me answer a little bit differently because you see, yeah. you can. So we, we have, so I, um, uh, I would like to put it a bit differently from the way Pet Peter said it. So from one yeah. point, we don't have field, field operators from, from somewhat more, I, I would like to go along a little bit with your logic. So yeah. we do have field operators, but we have to be careful because our operators, they, uh, the, point, the, point, the, moment, the point is that you, you write some operator, but our operators, they don't automatically map states, finite norm states to finite norm states. You have to be careful, right? In Minkowski, it's definitely not true. In Euclidean, it's true as long as all operators are inserted with Euclidean time separation. But we would like to insert operators with Euclidean time separation and also giving them some Lorentzian time, which is not equal to each other. And we would like to show that all such operators give us normalizable states. That's roughly what we need to show. Oh, but, uh, um, but this is not automatic because you know how do you show that a certain state after analytic continuation stays normalizable? Perhaps it's just norm going to blow up, going to go to infinity. You know, it's not. Yeah, I, I, it, I, I mean, I. I I realize that this is not what you're doing. So I, I just- No, but in, in some sense, that's exactly what I'm let, doing, yeah. No, but let, let me ask the fun. Let, let's suppose, and I'm, I realize this, this is probably gonna uh, get around uh, the problem, but, but not solve it. Suppose I were on a lattice, okay? Yeah. Then I would have um, a set of uh, variables on each lattice. I could call it phi, right? 
Yeah. And so I can work in a basis in which I can think of phi as um, uh, it, an operator who's in the basis where phi is diagonal, right? So to speak, yeah. you know, in other words. And then I would have a Hamiltonian or a transfer matrix. So I could certainly write down this um, operator uh, separated by displacements with, X, with respect yeah. to e to the t1 yeah. minus yeah, yeah, yeah. t2h and so yeah. on. And I would have a Hilbert space, okay? Yeah. I mean, yeah. A, a discrete one. I agree that if I've gotten around yeah, 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 yeah. Well, the part, lattice, right? you could do this. Yeah. Well, right. okay. so then, do this. see, then at that point, I would say I have my Hilbert space. I know my operate, I know my Hilbert space can be um, defined in terms of values of phi at each point. Yeah. And then I would just say put it tau to it, and I would get the analog Whiteman space again on a lattice. I agree. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. On the lattice, question, that would be a totally okay thing to do because on the lattice, right. you so need to write. Where do you get in trouble? Can you try to follow that as best you can? off a lattice or is it just impossible? You just say it's really difficult. And, they, and then the other question is what's, it's, it's what's really the impossible. meaning it's of really linear really, growth? Yeah, Where do really, I get linear growth as a problem? What, why does linear growth, I mean, I, I'm just trying to understand where does the linear growth? Um, so let me try to first of all, I mean, since yeah. you know this discussion makes sense if others are also following it. So let, let me sure. try to express uh, to explain to others what you just said and see uh, so that uh, people can appreciate your point. So yeah, okay. what uh, what uh, uh, Richard I think is saying is that if if our theory really lives on the lattice, then on the lattice the equation, you know, if we have a transform matrix, then we can really write that the lattice operator. Uh, phi hat tau, we can really write it as uh, e to the h tau, phi of zero, e to the minus h tau. And we can really define kind of, uh, con you know, if on the lattice we really do have this operator h, which is uh, suppose that this operator h is, say, is, is bounded from below, then, you know, if you have these operators and if you have the operator h, then nobody forbids us from saying that, uh, you know, tau plus it, we can really define it as e to the h tau plus it, uh, phi hat of zero, e to the minus h tau plus it. And, and we are basically done, meaning that we define some sort of Minkowski objects, you know, some objects in imaginary time. Right. So, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, this is we, this is what everybody we do doing this in the setup. We do this in the <laughs> setup, which where where kind of translation invariance is broken because we're on the lattice. Yes. Uh, rotation invariance is broken and so on. So yes. In in our setup, we we have exact rotation and translation invariance. Yes. On the other hand, uh, we uh, this operator only need that we have at our disposal and the operator phi that we have at our disposal are not really good operators. They are not uh, defined on the full Hilbert space. They have, they are unbounded. So you don't get finite objects automatically if you just perform this operation. So what, what instead you need to do is that you have yes. to carefully uh, argue that by uh, you, you have to argue that that objects that you get by this sort of procedures are indeed finite. But the way you argue this is not by uh, is by appealing to cauchy schwartz inequality. That's basically the only way uh -huh. that you have at your disposal to show that something is bounded by something is cauchy schwartz There is nothing else. And the amazing thing that you can pull it through but the price you pay is enormous because you have to perform not just one sequence of analytic, not just one analytic continuation, but you have to, to perform an infinite sequence of analytic continuations, which kind of extend you uh, the, you know, you kind of, the, in the first step, you rotate by at most 45 degrees. Then in the second step, you rotate by, you know, you get a little bit closer to Minkowski. So you perform kind of an infinite sequence of mm -hmm. combinations. Mm -hmm. And then in a limit, if everything works and your all your inductive hypotheses need to be checked, then you can show that you're done. But this like so that so this linear assumption is what gives rise to your Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. Is that it? 
Well, Where's, linear assumption is needed because you this linear growth condition is needed because since you have to perform this analytic continuation infinitely many times, as I said, uh -huh. it's an infinite uh -huh. sequence of analytic continuations, and every time you do it, your estimate degrades a little bit. So there is a kind so, of uh, I, I, I'm, I, I Cat and mouse just, uh, mathematics process. You have to show that after infinitely many steps, you are still left with something. And I, I guess I'm I'm kind of trying to understand what the linear growth assumption is. Is a statement on the nature of the Hilbert space? What is it? What is it telling you? It's. Uh... It's, uh, it's telling you that uh, by, uh, by uh, acting, so by acting on your Hilbert space repeatedly with operator phi, so we, we have this kind of operator phi, which is quote unquote, by mm -hmm. acting with it to the Hilbert space repeatedly, you can generate states of higher and higher norm. Aha. Uh -huh. And we would like to have some idea about how you know how fast this norm grows because we don't want this norm to be we don't want to to generate an infinite norm space state after finitely many steps for example that would be a disaster and uh, so if if this norm grows too fast then it means that your field is just too singular somehow is is this because um, uh, phi can I mean if I if I diagonalize it is a real variable between plus and minus infinity? What if I just had a compact variable? Would be would I be okay then? Suppose my fields are e to the i theta. Uh, I, I think you are uh, you you are um, uh, you are trying to kind of direct this discussion into the path integral point of view yeah, but I'm here doing. but yeah. here we are really do, dealing with uh, so our phi so i didn't have phi i had o right phi it was you said phi so i had o but but can i, I and, can, and can o can be for example co o could be e to the i phi in some free i think joao wants to say that we are going a lot over time joao what do you want to say okay no, anyway, we'll talk about it later. I, I'm very interested in it. A fascinating discussion, uh, Slava and uh, yeah. his friend. Actually, I, I had another, yeah. another yeah. more question, so we please yeah. finish this. Yeah. Oh, okay. No, no, I, I, I've asked more than my fair share. Go ahead. <laughs> so, first was one question more about the literature. So, because I, I think in some literature, Schwinger functions are also defined as distributions that act on like functions, test functions that vanish at coincident points faster than all derivatives, I don't know if you, faster yeah. than a power. Yeah. For you, it was not needed, right? Because you only acted on functions that did not have support at coincident points. But um, I wanted to just- yeah, yeah, thanks for asking. So, um, so indeed, mm, Ostrovada Schrader paper, it takes a little bit of a masochistic approach. So it indeed starts from Schwinger functions, which are distributions. And even in this uh, very general setup, they still manage to derive uh, Whiteman axioms. So this means that they have to reformulate so every condition that I mentioned, for example, linear growth condition and uh, all of these conditions, they can be reformulated in the language of distributions. Uh, it looks a little bit more technical, but more or less the same. So uh, the reason why I say it's masochistic is because, uh, first of all, from Weidman functions, as I explained, it's if, if our goal is to establish the equivalence of Weidman and Schwing and Osterweiler Schrader, then there is no uh, loss of generality to work with real analytic Schwinger functions because that's what Whiteman, Whiteman axioms immediately apply with no extra costs. So it looks masochistic. Uh, said that, um, if you 
like if you are good with distributions, I don't think uh, the there is a big complication. So I, in fact, like the first as the first step of their theorem, they show that if you start with with Schwinger functions which are distributions, you can actually show that they are real analytic. So and then the argument. Uh, the rest of the argument stays the same. So it's it's kind of an extra technical step, which I think is okay, not, not the most difficult part of their paper. So so I had another question which is a bit more more vague, like regarding the spirit of these axioms. So for example, one thing that none of these axioms puts in is the existence of a local stress energy tensor. Uh, should we add that? Do we gain something? Why? Why is that not important? I don't know. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Yeah, but okay. They um, uh, they did not explore explicit consequences of the existence of the stress tensor. But they are aware that the typical theory will contain many fields. And for example, white non axioms, they should apply not just to correlation functions of some scalar fields, but they should apply to correlation functions of any field, in particular to correlation functions of the stress energy tensor. So this they are aware of. Said that they did not really say, ah, well, but if there is just energy tensor, then some beautiful things will happen. So you won't find such, at least I'm not aware of such amazing results worth mentioning. But for example, in CFTs, we know that we have generalized three theories, right? Or, or more general, like boundary conformal flow theory, which obey their other CFT axioms, but don't have a stress tensor. So do, we, do these theories obey the Whiteman axioms? They, they shouldn't, no. Or what is the... They would, yeah, why not? They would obey the Whiteman axioms. Yeah. Although they are non-local. So, so the Whiteman axioms really do not uh, impose locality. No. No, but wait, wait, they have micro-causality, sorry. Are you sure about this? Yeah, they have microcausality, but I, th I think you can think about this uh, generalized for theories as sort of local theories in ADS, and then the microcausality and the fact that you can have a Hilbert space have kind of a natural interpretation. You're saying that uh, the light cone in the bulk is the same as the boundary. You cannot violate causality in the boundary going through the bulk. So, yeah. No, but even like you, I think you can take even more general generalized free theories where. Uh, the spectral density is not necessarily, not necessarily a scale invariant, and you will still they will still satisfy white one axioms. So um, uh, yeah, so it just shows that there's my that that, that um, yeah, it just shows that uh, causality is not necessarily a consequence in, of only locality. There is. something else about it. Are there any extra difficulties if you think of gauge theories? I mean, gauge theories, you have to either have gauge invariant operators or else you have trouble with uh, positivity of the Hilbert space if you go outside the gauge invariant sector. So with gauge theories, so first of all, gauge theories, I think are, are Correlation functions of gauge invariant operators and gauge theories are supposed to satisfy white moon axioms. Yes, right. But so is that I sufficient? Think, I think people believe that. So, uh, is so that sufficient to find the gauge potential when you have to go another step? To define the gauge potential. Well, the, See, gauge, the gauge potential, gauge... no, it's not decision to make gauge. What do you mean by gauge potential? Like some Wilson loop kind of things, aesthetic work. Well, I mean, the problem, I mean, I, I mean, you know, obviously, let's just take a gauge there. I mean, you could obviously just use F mu nu and various things like that that are uh, local gauge invariant operators. Yeah. But then the question is can you get to the gauge field 
or is it not necessary? You don't need that? I think the usual point of view is that. I mean, the Hilbert space is not, not positive uh, definite you, unless you, you should not try to get to get to the gauge field necessarily. Uh, yeah, we must be hard to right? try to get to it. It must be extremely hard to get to the gauge field, right? Because you know that uh, well, hard, or maybe it's even the wrong thing to do. Maybe you shouldn't try to get to the gauge field. Maybe if you try to get to the gauge field, then you are doing something wrong. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's a possibility. So you think you can deal with gauge theories without ever getting outside the proper. No, you, you should use spaces. the gauge field in intermediate. I mean, the, the, the dominant, I think, point of view says that you should use the gauge field. You may be allowed to use the gauge field in intermediate steps of your construction, but in the end, once the dust settled, uh, you just have beautiful white mode axioms for gauge invariant operators. Yeah, okay. There's no more anywhere uh, like in those. Okay. Sections. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. So yeah. it's just a it's just an intermediate construction. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess in gauge theories, depending on the phase, you can have like super selection sectors is you know, non zero electric charge, which is like important, well, maybe. Um, well, that's that's uh, easy, that's easy. But the problem, I mean, <laughs> as um, Mandelstam used to tell me, that gauge theory is either um, not positive definite or not local <laughs> in the gauge fields. You need Wilson lines. But you say you don't need Wilson lines to get the whole Hilbert space. Maybe that's true. But it's not that I don't need them. It's just uh, I'm describing kind of the the, the smallest uh, sector of the theory, which is which allows this. Uh, uh, I'm trying to review some classic literature that everybody knew very well 40 years ago, but uh, but nowadays students don't really learn it, so maybe they think that it's. Not important. I, my, my no, problem so, is, so this is going my, to be uh, true for any theory. Now, any particular theory, for example, gauge. See, my, my problem is the question. Of, electro operators will align so So you'll have to come up with some extension of, of this I mean, for real the, the, the algebra. I mean, obviously, I can have F mu it's a local gauge invariant operator. Okay. But yeah. um, you can have a, a, a large Wilson loop, which is non local, but is a gauge invariant operator. So the question is, can you get to the whole Hilbert space by only local operators? That's my problem. <laughs> but it's not the question. It's a question that I did not discuss in these lectures. So. Yeah, OK. But, but, I mean, but, but, but I think this is a question of definition. What do you mean by the whole Hilbert space? Usually people define super selection sector as everything you can get to by local operators. And uh, it's believed that in gauge theories, there might be other super selection sectors as like non-zero global oh, charges, using, for example. No, I'm not, I'm not changing charge. I'm just taking a, a large Wilson loop, which is a gauge invariant non-local operator. And do I need it? Maybe it's, I can build it from other things. I mean, I only need a base. I, 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 well, I, I don't know a proof, but I think it's believed that it's it's in the super selection sector because there is no reason for it not to be. But uh, yeah, maybe, I, I, I'm certainly not sure if this is proved. Certainly in the same sector, for sure. The question is, can you build it from local operators? I think the, the idea would be that you should be the state that it creates. You should be able to approximate it arbitrarily well using local operators. It's not necessarily yeah, maybe that's exactly the, case. the same state. Yeah, then 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 you're then you're okay. Yeah. Okay. That was my hope that this kind of discussion will arise and um, as a result of these lectures. We have well, more questions. Well, very interesting. Thank you very much. Is someone else question or no? I think people are out of questions. So. Yeah, thank you very much again, Slava.